Grace be, on, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 23. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Kindly be seated. In the name of our Savior, the anointed only begotten Son of God the Father, his given name from heaven is Jesus. The anointed Son of God, again, whose birth we celebrate this day with joy. Do any of you still get a newspaper at home during the week? Did you bring your newspaper with you? Oh, good. I don't want to hear or read any bad news today. This is a day of nothing but joy and happiness. Despite so much bad worldly news, we are to celebrate today great joy, which shall be to all people. Remember that Jesus didn't come to bring good news. Jesus is good news. Some of you may remember, and I referred to this before, you may remember the movie, uh, Sherry and I just watched it again the other night or last week on a TV network somewhere, the movie, Oh God. Do you remember that? <laughs> a really funny, funny movie. Those of you that didn't see it, and for those of you that did see it, let me remind you, uh, one of the best scenes, one of the first scenes, there is no God, is George Burns comes to earth as God. And he's dressed in a fishing hat and a vest, khaki shorts, and he suddenly, all of a sudden, appears to John Denver. John Denver was a manager in a grocery store. And he scares, in his sudden appearance, he scares John Denver, and John Denver turns around and he says, who are you? And he says, I'm God. And John Denver says, well, why are you dressed like that? And he says, I wanted to dress as somebody you could identify with. That is a really good analysis of what happened 2,000 years ago. That Jesus, not named Jesus in the Old Testament, but he was in the Old Testament. John 14 says, in the beginning was the word logos, and the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. The second person of the Trinity took a appearance to us that we can understand. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address has in it a wonderful document, by the way. It has 266 words in it. The Ten Commandments are comprised of 297 words. Our United States Bill of Rights has 463 words. All wonderful documents, as many others are too. Listen to this again. 15 words, powerful words, life-giving words, eternity-changing words. You shall call, give him the name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. One of the greatest philosophers that are recognized by scholars, one of them is Socrates, who lived from the late 400 BC to the early part, or from the early part of the year 400 BC. Here's what Socrates said. Oh, that someone would arise God as man, just show us God. 
Here's one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived. Listen to this. Oh, that God would come as man and show us God in human form. Plato was a student of Socrates, and he lived at the, be the ending of 400 B.C. to the beginning of the 300s B.C. And here's what he said. Unless a God-man comes to us and reveals to us the supreme being, there is for us as humanity no help or no hope. And then Plato's student was Aristotle, and he said similar things. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let me read to you a poem. All ye beneath life's crushing load, whose forms are bending low, who toil along a climbing way with painful steps and slow, look now. For glad and golden hours Come swiftly to the wing. Oh, rest beside the weary ro road and hear the angels sing. That poem was written by a man by the name of Edward, Edward Sears right before the start of the Civil War. Nobody knows why he wrote that poem, but I suspect it was because he could see already out on the horizon down into the future just a year or so the, the storms on the horizon of the Civil War, which would become father against son, son against father, brother against brother, etc. And all we need to do is either read our newspaper or listen to CNN or Fox News and listen to the feelings expressed all around us. We've had a really tough last several years. And the negativity that we often hear around us sometimes makes us think of what the poem said. We're just asking for a little rest beside the weary road. God became flesh. And he dwelt among us as one of us. Again, as one of us. We are not alone in our exhaustion. We're not alone in our fear. This is the single most unique quality of Christianity that makes our religion different from any other religion there is. Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Shintoism, the Muslim faith. None of them have their God coming into the flesh. And by the way, no other God was ever murdered by the hands of those he created. And the word became flesh. God became a soft baby. And remember, remember this. God did not cease to be God. He was both God and man. It's called a state of humiliation, humiliation and his state of exaltation. He was always God but for that period of time, from his temptations, his crucifixion, starting with his birth, he was left aside those attributes of God. That's why he could die on the cross. You can't kill God. But he was 100% God, 100% man, to identify with us. It's called the incarnation. He added manhood to his being fully God. He experiences now. He experienced, but he still does. He experiences 
the weaknesses that we feel. He experienced the frustration of sinful man. He experienced the news of his day, just like we do of our day. But remember this, we are never, ever alone. He descended the third day, he rose again, and ascended into heaven. And yet he is still with us today. After a while, when we receive his body and blood, the Holy Eucharist, he reminds us of that. That's an event that's taking place this morning right here. God coming into us. That's the message of Easter. You are no longer alone. Not one of you. I have never met a person, no matter what age, no matter what ethnic group, who wasn't important to God. I love the song. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices, for yonder dawns a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, night sublime. Oh, night when Christ was born. Oh, night. Oh, night divine. There is, as it were, over the major in that cattle barn because there's no room for them in the inn. It is written over that entrance if you kneel with your heart at the major. 2,000 years ago, since then, the lettering hasn't faded. The love it speaks of is still exciting. The truth hasn't changed. The grace is still unbelievable. The mercy is still undefinable. Here's what it reads. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. This child in a manger 2,000 years ago, believe me, is there to affect your everyday living. Your everyday living. Martin Luther in the year 1535 wrote one of the most beautiful Christmas hymns or carols that there is. The original song was 15 verses long, but I'm just going to read verse 7, 8, 11, and 15. Give heed my heart, lift up thine eyes. What is it in your young major lies? Who is this child so young and fair? The blessed Christ child lieth there. Welcome to earth, thou noble guest, through whom the sinful world is blessed. Thou comest to share my misery. What thanks shall I return to thee? And thus, dear Lord, it pleaseth thee to make this truth quite plain to me, that all the world's wealth, honor, and might are naught and worthless in thy sight. Ah, dearest Jesus, holy child, make thee a bed soft, undefiled. Within my heart that it may be a quiet chamber kept for thee. And God reaches out to you and wants you to receive him and stay with him and trust him and believe. He says, here, for your very Christmas. God grant that to all of us. <clears throat>